church. <laughs> um, we had a we had our Oktoberfest uh, celebration here a little while ago at All Saints, and uh, we we made up some nice hats for the occasion that we sold at the Oktoberfest. We have some left over. If you're interested in getting a uh, some Luther wear <laughs> from Pastor Wear. Uh, <laughs> you can uh, you can pick that up. Uh, there's uh, I think they're uh, I don't I can't remember how much they are ten ten dollars. You can pick them up in the Narthex. Uh, also, um, we are videotaping today's uh, presentations. As soon as those uh, uh, recordings are edited and placed online, I will um, post a link at the Facebook page at Carolina Professional Lutherans Facebook page. If you're not a member or, a, or following that Facebook page, you may want to do that. Also, uh, we'll put links up at uh, carolinalutherans.com, which is the uh, website for the Carolina Confessional Lutherans. Um, I, I also know that some of uh, Dr. Weinrich's uh, papers on martyrdom exist out there in cyberspace, and I will post links to those as well as additional resources for you to, uh, to see and enjoy. Um, also, we uh, uh, for for our events, uh, we have our monthly LOCI meetings that we have here every month. Um, we have our annual Sinago retreat every year, and uh, and of course this event. Uh, if you would like to be on the email list, if you aren't currently, and you but you would like to be on the email list for all of these events, uh, I put a, a sign up. Uh, pad there right by the, the uh, doors on the way out of the sanctuary and you can uh, put your name and email address down and we will add you to the list so that you know about all the upcoming events. Any questions about any of that? So I think now what, what we'll do is we'll invite uh, Dr. Weinrich to come back up. He's going to present till about uh, 2.30 or so and then have some time for questions afterward. Okay. So let's welcome him back. Chair was getting really comfortable over there, actually. That okay. water is for you, by the way. Pardon? Oh, we need to hook you back up to the. Uh, hook me back up. And this is water for you, though. Okay. There you go. Are we on? No. Are we on? Are we on? Yeah. Are we on? Yes. We are. We're on. We noted that oftentimes in early Christian texts, uh, Eucharistic language and imagery is in play. Whereas I noted at the very end of our morning session, the supper is not merely that which strengthens faith, but is itself the reality of life over death, the partaking of that flesh and blood in which and through which death itself was defeated and was in life again raised up. Yet the ongoing communion with Jesus began with baptism. And it is necessary to dwell for a while on the implications of baptism for early Christian understanding of confession and martyrdom. In his little exhortation to the martyrs, Tertullian interprets Ephesians 4.30 as a martyr text. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you have been sealed unto the day of redemption. Tertullian co connects, by way of this passage, the reality of baptism with the difficulties of persecution and martyrdom. In the case of the martyrs, the spirit which has sealed them at baptism is none other than the spirit that has also led them to the moment of their suffering. Now, in the face of such sufferings, the martyrs are exhorted not to grieve the spirit by denial of Christ and apostasy. Should they deny Christ, 
they would thereby cause the spirit of their baptism to flee. The thinking behind this little exhortation requires perhaps some further comment. The New Testament speaks of baptism as a begetting from above, or a new creation. What in Titus 3.5 is a pollen genesia, creation or genesis all over again. Through baptism, therefore, the sinner has received a new identity. It is not that the old identity has been sanctified, it is rather that a new identity has been brought forth. A new person, which is defined and indeed is established by a new set of relations and obligations. This new identity is not natural, nor is it of the flesh. It is of the spirit, and so this new identity is grounded in God and is directed toward the resurrection of the dead. Paul speaks of this new identity given in baptism. For we have received the spirit of the adoption unto sonship, by which spirit we cry out, Abba, Father. Almost certainly, or at least I think it very likely, the reference here to Abba Father is in fact to the first words of the Lord's Prayer. In any case, the Lord's Prayer's address to our Father who art in heaven was intentionally and express, expressly at every point understood to be the prayer of the baptized. In fact, it was very common until Christianity became universal, in which case everything that the early church practiced was up in smoke, right? But you if you lived, at, let us say, in the year 150, you never heard the Lord's Prayer until you were baptized, or maybe at, on the eve of your baptism. What is so commonplace in our churches where we have open doors and we don't even know who are in pews. And they, they say they are Father. The early church would have thought of this as deeply problematic. See? Only the baptized had the right to address God as Father. Because you have been baptized into the Son, whose Father God is. So God is not your Father because He made you. He is eternally the Father of the Son into whom you have been baptized. And so participation in the death and resurrection of Christ was the necessary, what? Qualification, although that's certainly not the right word, but experience by which God became your Father. Our Father who art in heaven was a baptismal prayer. You are, as I was telling some people at lunch, your identity is by way of relation. And so the question, and certainly this would have been true of the ancient world, the question, who are you, was answered by who is your father. And so, as we shall see in the martyrdom of Perpetua and Felicitas, the, the magistrate tries to get Perpetua to have to have sympathy for her father, who if she does not honor the emperor, the father will himself in his daughter be embarrassed, will be socially discredited and all the rest. To which she simply says, my father is in heaven. Right? And so in this way is, deeply disassociates her identity from her earthly father. Just really quick, something that's always puzzled me. In John 1, uh, given the, the power and authority of the exousia, I'm guessing this ties into that, and I didn't know if there was any background to the use of that word, the exousia to become the children of God. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit of an interesting use of that term, exousia, which is often translated authority or power or something like that. It is, in any case, somewhat unnaturally used in there. For example, at the end of Matthew, Jesus will say, all exousia has been given me in heaven and earth. So exousia was a power with authority to exercise power in order that you might accomplish something. Okay? So a magistrate had exousia, a lord, a king had exousia because they had the legitimate power to exercise law. Something had to happen by way of their command. So in John 12 and 13 that you're referring to, that he gave to them the exousia to become, seems to be something else going on there. Because we don't have the exousia to affect our own relation as child to God. Uh, I, I think, Justin, if you're a asking me what's going on there, I think the real answer is, I don't know. I don't feel so bad. <laughs> <laughs> on the other hand, I have a suggestion. Okay. Uh, because that passage finds its narrative echo in John 3, John 3, 5, and uh, 3, 3, and 3, 5, my hunch is that exosia there is, in fact, a reference to the Spirit. It, at least it makes sense. Right? Uh, but it's, it is one of those things where you just have to kind of take a look at the text, kind of how does this text work itself, and just see what you can come up with, because it's not explicit. It's not actually identifying anything there. So it is an interpretive question, but my hunch is that it's the Holy Spirit. In any case, the explanation of, of verse 13 is important. Gave to them the exousia, maybe the Holy Spirit, to become the children of God who were not begotten of flesh or the will of man or by the way of the desires of man, but but from God. So they were begotten from God. That begottenness makes them children of God. That language does happen in John 3 where the Spirit is clearly involved. So it was kind of those, that thought process that leads me to that suggestion. But it's very important, again, to keep in mind that baptism made God to be our Father. And and in that relationship, we have a new personal identity. As I mentioned to some at lunch, it was not uncommon for Christians to receive new names at their baptism. They gave away their pagan name, they received a baptismal name. We've mentioned Polycarp, uh, a good example. Polycarp meaning much fruit, almost certainly taken from John's Gospel. If you do my will or you remain in me, you will bear much fruit. Uh, he was known as an effective bishop and teacher of Asia Minor. So perhaps that's in one respect why he got this name, although it appears to be a baptismal name. The identity of the baptized is that of child or son of the Heavenly Father. There is in this conviction a distinctly ascetic and otherworldly aspect, which makes all earthly, natural, fleshly relationships radically penultimate and incapable of placing upon us ultimate claims. In early Christian martyr texts, this is especially expressed in relation to earthly familial ties and to the claims of imperial authority and power. In this context, it is important to remember that Christian faith cannot be reduced to private opinion. Christian truth does not understand itself to be an opinion 
which, as it were, may be added or abstracted or substracted to the storehouse of other opinions. <clears throat> Rooted as it is in baptism, Christian faith makes a claim concerning the fundamental, irreducible reality of the human person. Hence the common recurring confession of the Christian martyr, Christianus Amy, Sum Christianus, or in English, I am Christian. Right? Uh, just uh, as I, what, what is your name, ma'am, that was speaking to you at lunch? Yeah. Katie. Katie? Okay, I was talking to Katie, and very often in English translations, this Christianus sum, Latin, is translated, I am a Christian, right? But it's better translated, I am Christian, right? Can you sense the rhetorical difference there? If you say, I am a Christian, it abstracts your Christianness. And you, just like you could say, I am a Republican, or I am a Sooner from Oklahoma, which in fact I am, right? But then you can have a, a number of different associations. But if you say, I am Christian, that is an all-encompassing claim, then Christian is indeed a, di a direct predication of the subject, I. What characterizes this I, namely being Christian? So it's a very important confession, which finds itself in many, many early martyr texts. And one of the clearest evidences that in fact in martyr situ situations, the question of identity was in play. Who actually am I? And as I noted just a moment ago, that question, who am I, immediately, organically, re implies as well the question, who is my God? <coughs> who I am and who my God is were questions that were intimately and inseparably related. To make that claim, I am Christian, was not merely to state that one believed such and such to be true. It was fundamentally a claim of personal identity that reordered one's basic social, family, as well as political allegiances. All of these allegiances now, in fact, being associated with God and his church. Christian martyrdom, therefore, was intrinsically a statement that had social, family, and political implications. It radically penultimatized all earthly claims. Christian martyrdom was, therefore, not an act of heroism that was a personal and individual <coughs> effort. It was an essentially public act that called into question any and all <coughs> ultimate transcendent attachment to that which was not God. What characterizes then all martyr stories is the report of public trials and public spectacles. The martyr stands before the world and gives witness, first with the mouth and then with his death. This is why martyrdom must be regarded as a fundamentally ecclesial act, a churchly event. In his death, the martyr makes clear that no earthly attachment, not that of family, not that of nation or ruler, was an ultimate good. That which was alone ultimately true and good was simply the relation to God expressed in the confession of faith, I am Christian. Let me give a couple of examples from early martyr texts. In the second century, the acts of the skeleton martyrs, Scylla was a little town in what today is Libya, or perhaps even Tunisia, not too far from ancient Carthage. 
In this act, the proconsul Saturninus <clears throat> demands that the Christians honor the emperor with oath and prayer. He says, we Romans are a religious people, and our religion is a simple one. We swear by the genius of our Lord, the Emperor, and we offer prayers for his health. Swear then by the genius of our Lord, the Emperor. It is clear that the proconsul thinks that the Christians owe the Emperor a pledge of allegiance. He is Noster Dominus, our Lord. That such an oath suggests an ultimate allegiance is clear from the fact that the punishment for not swearing is death. To live then requires allegiance to an earthly political power. In response to the proconsul's demand, the Christian Speratus replies, I do not recognize the imperium of this world. Rather, I serve that God whom no man sees nor can see with the eye. Another Christian, Scitinus, says, We have no one whom we fear except our dominum, our nostrum dominum, namely God who is in heaven. Donata asks, <coughs> Pay honor to Caesar as Caesar, however give fear to God, ultimate awe. Thereupon various Christians repeat one after the another, Christianus sum, Christianus sum, Christianus sum. And Speratus then says again, I am Christian. And we are informed, all of them concurred. In this very simple North African early martyr text, we see very clearly that the fundamental question in play is this. Who is the true Lord in the world? But that question was in no way an abstract one. The question, who is the true Lord in the world, was in fact this question. Who has the power to give and to take away life? The confession, I am Christian, was nothing other than the claim that all earthly powers are penultimate and cannot legitimately claim ultimate loyalties. This is a central idea of early martyr thinking. We must return to this aspect a little later. But it was not only political attachments that rendered secondary and penultimate in early martyr texts. Family ties, too, are surrendered up and sundered altogether. As we mentioned, perhaps the most poignant example is found in the Passion of Perpetua and Felicitas. Two young North African women, Perpetua, who is clearly a fairly rich matron, and Felicity, her servant girl. <coughs> They were martyred during the time of Septimius Severus, around the year 202. When Perpetua, a young noblewoman, is arraigned before the Roman magistrate, her father appears and begs her not to dishonor her family and bring upon it ill repute and social disgrace. Do not abandon me to the reproach of men. Think of your brothers, of your mother, of your aunt, also your child. Give up your pride. You will destroy us all. Later, when the Christians were brought to a public hearing in the forum, Perpetua is again confronted by her father, who brought along with him Perpetua's small child in arms. He says to Perpetua, Sacrifice! Have mercy on your child! Urged by the governor to take pity upon her father and infant, Perpetua is officially asked, Are you Christian? To which she responded, <coughs> Christianus sum. The claim to Christian identity 
bears within itself the claim that all family ties, associations, obligations are temporal, penultimate, and may not demand our deepest loyalties. In Perpetua's confession, I am Christian, she embodies then the words of Jesus, whoever loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Let us now turn to what is the central issue in all these counts. And that is fundamentally the question of idolatry. <coughs> what actually is idolatry? We've already referred to the words of Speratus in the Acts of the Skeleton Martyrs. I do not recognize the imperium, the rule of this world. I serve rather that God whom no man sees. It is an early, it is an interesting fact in early Christian martyr texts that the primary confession of the martyr is not as we might expect, confession in belief of Jesus and his resurrection. Until later, I don't know of any martyr text that, where the martyr stands and says, I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. The fundamental confession is that God is the creator of all things. The late second century martyr the martyrdom of Apollonius, around 180, is a good example. When Apollonius is brought before the court, the proconsul Perennus asks him, Apollonius, are you a Christian? To this inquiry, Apollonius responds, yes, I am Christian. <coughs> and for that reason, I worship and fear the God who made heaven and earth, sea and all that is in them. This confession of Apollonius is not explicitly the confession of the second article of the Creed, nor for that matter of the third article. It is a confession of the first article. I believe in God, the Creator. In the context of martyrdom, this cannot be such an abstract claim, such as I believe that God has created the world. In fact, Luther's explanation of the first article is rather to the point. I believe that God has made me and all creatures. It is important to recognize in my, this little explanation of Martin Luther's that it is not a claim of how the world began. That's not the claim. Luther is not saying, I believe that so many years ago and God made the world in such and such a way. There's nothing cosmological about his explanation to the confession, I believe that God is the creator. He immediately makes that my confession, right? Not what I believe to be true, but whether I believe that I am the creature of God. Right? And then he goes on, I believe that God has made me and all creatures, and he has given me my eyes and ears, my reason and all my senses, and still preserves them, right? Also, house and home, fields, cattle, and all my goods, and he richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support this body and life, for all of which is our duty to thank and praise, serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. Amen. Right? Well, it just isn't true, is it? I mean, when we say, I believe that God has made me and all creatures that is given me my eyes and ears, my reason, and all my senses, and still preserves them, that is fundamentally, sir, not the case. As I know from you and the fact that you wear glasses. Okay. I have arthritis in my right knee, my left hip. I'm hobbling around here because I'm 71 years old. When I was your age, I could run faster than anybody in this room, I believe. Right now, I have trouble getting to the men's room. Right? Things kind of go downhill. It isn't true that God preserves them. It isn't experientially true. 
So what was Luther all about here? Edmund Schleck in his Theology of the Lutheran Confessions writes to that passage. It is as difficult to confess that God is the creator as it is to confess that he raises the dead. Because in fact, to confess